Hey, Donna Schwartz here. In this video, I want to perform for you the alto saxophone solo Hunter's Chorus from Freshers. Um, this was composed by Carl Maria von Weber, or Weber, as you may say, arranged by Sigurd Rascher. Now, this is a popular solo uh, level two New York State School Music Association uh, solo festival. So a lot of students tend to, to go on this solo, and it's a great piece. A couple of things I want to point out for you, uh, a couple of mistakes in the part. By the way, my part is over here, that's why I'm looking over here. There's a couple of mistakes in the part I want to point out for you that you should definitely change and notate in pencil. Um, and then I want to talk to you about performance points. Things are going to help you to perform this piece at your best. Let me start with the errata. Those are the mistakes. All right, you got your part out, right? Yeah? Okay, good. All right, we start off with an eighth rest, that's fine. The next measure is a whole measure rest. No, that's not four beats, it's two. Two beats in a measure, quarter note gets one beat, right? Okay, so we've got a whole measure rest there. The next measure is the problem. This is the second full measure. It's written as if the thing is in 4-4 four, four time. It's not, okay? So that first rest should really be a quarter rest, little lightning bolt, all right? So put a lightning bolt in pencil above that. So you have a quarter rest followed by an eighth rest. So the counting for the uh, second full measure should be uh, one, two, and one. So it should be one, like that. Really important, not only change that in your alto saxophone part, change that in the piano score, the score that you give the judge to look at, really important. Um, if you're giving the judge another copy of your part, notate it in the part. Now, they're, they're pretty much aware of this anyway, but it's always good to be very diligent in marking up your parts correctly in pencil. Why not erasable pen? Because you can never really erase it. It's still there. Okay, anyway, so that's the first mistake. Go down to the third line, the very last measure, all right? So you have D, and then you have E, F sharp, F sharp, G, ah, 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 ah. Those first two notes of the four sixteenth notes, they're wrong. So it should be D, quarter note, then D, then E, and then F sharp and G. So notate that on your part, notate that in the piano part as well, okay? Really important. Um, look, we all make mistakes, publishers make mistakes, it happens, but it's important for you to notate that. So that's the third line down, very last measure. The first two sixteenth notes should be D and E, not E and F sharp. All right, keep going down. <laughs> all right, the second to last line from the bottom. Okay, so you start off with, uh, with this. All right, now the second measure on the second to last line, you have A quarter note, and then you have two F-sharp eighth notes. Notes are fine. You should put a slur mark from the A to the F-sharp. Okay, just the first F-sharp. So what's written is this. It should be. That follows what's happening throughout the entire piece. Notate that in your part. Notate that in the piano part. And by the way, when you notate that in the piano part, just initial it or have your teacher initial it. Okay? Um, so that's it for the errata for this piece. Now, the tempo says, lively! So be alive when you're playing it. <laughs> Here's the deal. You don't want to play it at super breakneck speed so that your fingers are like, you know, twisted like pretzels. That doesn't help. It doesn't help you. I'm going to say to you that the best tempo for this tune is going to be somewhere between, I'll bring it down, uh, 88 for the quarter note up to 96. I I'm going to perform this for you at 92. Okay, so I think 92 would be a really good uh, tempo to take this at. Okay, so that's what I'd suggest. Now, do you start practicing the piece at 92? No. <laughs> that's really not good. You should start by setting your metronome. I'm going to say at 60. So let's get this. This, by the way, this is older than most of you. This is really old. I got this in 1984. Can you imagine? This is really old. And it still works. Why? Because it's a Korg. 
Korg makes really good metronomes. No, I don't work for Korg, but I gotta tell you, this thing is great. It's a metronome and a tuner. Anyway, okay, so what I would do is I'd set this at 60 to start with. And the first thing I would do is I would look for where those breath marks are. Those are your phrases. And I would work phrase by phrase by phrase. So here we go with the performance points. Never stick the instrument in your face and just play a piece the first time you get it. Whether it's a band piece, you know, for school, whether it's um, an exercise from your method book, especially when it's a solo. Because what happens is, whatever you play first, if you make mistakes, guess what? Your brain remembers that. If you play it great, guess what? Your brain remembers that, okay? Your brain remembers whatever you do. If you make a mistake, it's gonna take that much longer to break the habit of that mistake. So your best bet is you set your metronome at 60 and you look through the piece and you listen to a performance of it. So I'm hoping that you know this performance that I give you will be good enough for you to follow along. So you listen to a really good performance of the piece and you look for patterns. What are patterns? Patterns are things that repeat, okay? So you look for phrases that repeat. For, you could even say notes that repeat, but I like to think of phrases, sentences, or part of uh, musical phrases or sentences. You'll notice that first phrase, repeats a million and a half times. Don't forget the half, okay? So you wanna look for those things that repeat as you're listening to the recording. Don't stick the thing in your face yet. Okay, so listen, look for things that repeat. The next step, is gonna to be to take that opening phrase, which does, does repeat a million times, you put your metronome at 60, and you sit there and you finger. I would say finger just the one, two, three, the first four measures. So break that phrase in half. Once your fingers know where they're going, I know that sounds weird, but once your fingers know where they're going and you don't have to think about fingering when you're playing, stick it in your mouth and do air sounds, which means you're going to articulate, but you're not going to press up into the reed to get sound. Like it is. Now, don't play it yet because your brain's gonna remember the sound thing more than anything else. Don't play it yet until your fingers know where they're going. Here's the other thing, and they're relaxed. If your fingers are all tense, um, your brain's gonna remember that, and every time you play this, you're gonna get all tensed up, so that's not good. So I would do air sounds again for that first four measures, that first half of the musical phrase. And I would do that, you know, people say do it at least three times, do it at least 10 times. Do it until your fingers know where they're going. Also do it until your tongue knows how to articulate it. Now the articulation in this piece throws people off because a lot of times you have two notes that are slurred, two notes that are tongued. Sometimes you have an eighth note on the last upbeat of a measure slurring into the next measure, all right? so. What you really need to do are those air sounds. Hey, and listen, if you wanna play jazz, which is all about articulation, definitely do your air sounds, really nail that. And for some people, it's the tip of the tongue, touching the tip of the reed. For others, it's the front part of the tongue, touching the tip of the reed, and really getting away very quickly. If you don't get away quickly, you're gonna squeak, by the way, just to let you know. Okay, so just a, uh, just a, couple, just a couple of key points right there. Um, dynamics. You're going to start off kind of strong, mezzo forte, okay? Sort of the way I'm speaking right now. Then in the middle of the piece, you see a piano there. Make a difference. Now, you don't want to get so soft that you get a scratchy tone or no tone at all, but make a difference between the mezzo forte. That's huge, all right? Then you have in that same line, the one, two, three, fourth line down, at the end of the line, you have a crescendo back to mezzo forte. When I perform this, um, I'm doing that mezzo forte, but I'm also kind of extending that crescendo as well. And you're gonna see that in, the, in my performance of that. 
Then a few lines down from there, the piano comes back. No, not the piano, the piano. <laughs> the soft comes back. And then you see a crescendo. What I'm gonna do in the performance, I'm actually gonna slow it down just a little bit. I'm putting a little retardando though there. If you like that, write that in your part, R-I-T, dot, 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 um, until the end of that line. So this is the third line up from the bottom where you have the piano on the A and you have a whole bunch of A's happening there. Um, this is basically what I'm going to do. And let me see if I can do this. Uh, actually, hold on. Let me get the metronome up to nine to two. So I just came off of... Okay, so did you see what I, what I did there? All right, I got really soft in the A and then I did a crescendo, but I also slowed it down just a pinch. All right, and then I took a quick breath and I made that opening statement again. Okay, which brings the end of the piece happening there. Okay, so dynamics, really important. I would also say as you're going through the last two lines, I would gradually do a little bit of a crescendo. In fact, that last line, it's like a trumpet fanfare. It really is. Um, let's see, starting from typical trumpet line right there. I would make that kind of loud, to be honest with you. And if you're gonna do that, again, write it in in pencil, F, forte, and write it in the piano part, okay? Now, the key with this, get your tongue very light against the tip of the reed, okay? You don't wanna be smacking that reed um, or tonguing too hard because then it's gonna slow you down. So the other last tip that I'm going to mention to you are the fingerings. Um, F sharp, D, F sharp, A, that fanfare part on the last line, keep your fingers close to the keys if not on top of them. It'll make it a lot easier to play that last line and basically the whole piece, to be honest with you. So keep your fingers relaxed and on the keys and you're either pressing or release. Press, release, press, release, press, release. Okay, that's all you're doing, okay? You can even say press, rest, press, rest. But try to keep your fingers on top of the keys. It's gonna make you a lot more um, facile <laughs> and flexible with your fingerings. Okay, so let me have you hear the performance and then I'll talk to you again after the show. of the piece, I want to bring up a couple of more points. I mentioned before that you start working on the piece by first listening to it. Listen to the performance when you first get the piece, listen to the, to the performance once every day that you practice, all right? And do that for a couple of weeks. And then afterwards, listen to it once or twice a week. When we're starting out, we want to get really good sounds in our heads. We want to get good, um, good tone, you know, all that kind of stuff, get that up here. Because in the beginning, no one sounds fantastic, all right? And the only way that we really get really good is by listening to others, listening to um, role models, okay? So, so please do that. The next thing, definitely set that metronome at 60 and work phrase by phrase until you get through the whole piece at quarter note equals 60. And I don't mean that's in the first practice session. That may take a few sessions, a couple of weeks. No big deal. Once you get the whole piece at quarter note equals 60, next day, 
bump it up a notch to 63 or whatever, you know, I, I would say 63. Then do the same thing. Work on the tricky little phrases for you with fingerings, air sounds, articulations and fingerings, and then playing it. And then every time that it feels comfortable, it feels right, and you're having fun playing it at that tempo, bump it up a notch. All right, now, you notice the key word, fun. If you're not having fun making music, what are you doing? <laughs> okay, and that brings me to the other point of this piece. They even mention it in the notes on the bottom. Make sure you read them. The key word, joyful. Make this sound joyful. Don't make it sound like a funeral march, okay? Music is meant for the audience and the performer, but the audience to enjoy it. Now, if you're approaching it like this, well, yeah, technically it's good, but you know what? That put me to sleep in the middle. All right, it's not saying anything. It's like a person that speaks like this all the time and you have to sit there and take notes in class for 40 minutes straight and then you're going to get a test. Woohoo! All right, that'll really keep you awake. I've had professors like that. Oh boy. <laughs> so listen, don't do that to other people. Put some life into the music, okay? So phrasing, musical sentences, phrasing. You've got those breath marks there. That's why this is a great piece too because it shows you where the big phrases are, the small phrases are. So in order to make something sound really good, you don't stay at the same, you know, dynamic level. When it gets to be like a little bit of a peak, you know, a high point in the phrase, you kind of make it a little louder. And then as your sentence is finishing, you kind of get softer, trail off a little bit, right? So for that first phrase, <laughs> I'm going to call what I just played actually really a short phrase because it doesn't really end until a couple of lines down. That phrase almost ends on a peak, okay? But you want to taper that off uh, a little bit from the B to the A, C sharp B to the A. But did you see what I did? It, it was, you know, it wasn't like this the whole time. It was like this, 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 okay? Now, it's really important to approach your music that way. And when you're doing your, your sounds, your air sounds, you can't make a mistake here, except maybe with the fingering, but allow yourself to be creative and imagine how you would phrase that. Sort of like you're telling your best friend a really cool story. You wouldn't say it in a monotone, you'd put excitement into it, okay? Now again, if you wanna play jazz, Listen, it's all about the phrasing too. When you start to improvise, you don't play a solo at this level, you know, at a 10 the whole time or at a three the whole time. You start up kind of low over here, build it up, bring a little down and start to build it up, bring, bring a little down, then finally have your peak and then you bring it down. Okay, so same thing with classical music. All right, approach it that way. Okay, so I know this video has been too long. I tend to talk too much, sorry, <laughs> but I do hope that it helped you. If you would like um, more help in terms of preparing for NISMA, I do have a product out. It is called, ready, drum roll. <laughs> NISMA demystified everything you need to know to nail that audition. Now, in this product, I talk to you about how to prepare mentally, and I also have very successful students talk to you through videos about how to prepare mentally, um, emotionally, all those types of things. I am anal retentive, so I think about everything when I'm preparing for NISMA. So I've got a PDF checklist of all the things that you need to think about beforehand. I have lists for way beforehand, a little bit beforehand, the day of, <laughs> and afterwards, okay? So I, I've been teaching uh, elementary students for a long time, so I know all the things that people are concerned about. So I've got all those types of lists. I also talk to you about what's in the mind of a NISMA judge or an adjudicator as they are for, properly known. Um, so in those videos that I'm talking about that, you get to see what we're really looking for from you. 
Okay, and I'll give you a hint. It's not, you know, just 100% perfection of the music, all right? It's other things. So this product, Nisma Demystified, Everything You Need to Know to Nail That Audition, is available on my website at www.donnaschwartzmusic.com. I've got links below the video. Check it out. It'll definitely help you out. Um, it's, it's for band people, string people, vocal people, and jazz people. Jazz, okay, there's a lot of issues with jazz. People don't know exactly what to prepare for. I talked to you about that. Uh, there's whole bunches of videos on that as well. So, if you like this video, like it. Give it a thumbs up. <laughs> share it, share it with your friends, share it with your fellow music teachers. Um, I wanna help as many students as possible prepare for NISMA and have a really fantastic, fun time performing because hey, like I said before, isn't music about having fun and portraying that fun to the audience? I think so. All right, thanks for joining me today. I hope this video helped you. And on that note, take care, have a great day. Hey, Donna Schwartz here. In this video, I want to perform for you these. Blah, 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 blah. Hey, Donna Schwartz here. Did you like that crack in my voice? Hey!